token of scientific excellence, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows. Uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping meetings. Um, if you could leave your microphones muted uh, for the entire uh, duration, and then we'll uh, do hands up and, and questions at the end, if that's okay. Um, if you are unable to unmute or you don't want to um, be on, on a, on a team's chat in front of everyone, uh, please feel free to put the questions in the chat and I'll ask them at the end. Um, we are going to be recording the session. Oh, sorry, we've just started. Um, so if you have an objection to being recorded, I'm afraid now is the now is the time to raise your objection and leave. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ed. As I'm sure everyone knows, Ed is a recipient of countless prizes. Uh, the 2016 Breakthrough Prize, $3 million, the Brain Prize, 1 million euros, and of course, the most prestigious of all, uh, the 2012 uh, Department of Bioengineering uh, Bioengineering Annual Lecture, um, which I'm sure everyone will agree is, uh, is up there in the pantheon. Um, I'm not going to waste any more time. I'll hand over now. Ed, take it away. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and the offer to come uh, speak uh, to you. I'm really excited to be here virtually. I wish I'd be there in person, of course, but um, we have uh, a lot of different uh, technologies that I want to tell you about today uh, because, of course, our group develops tools for looking at and controlling biological systems like the brain. Uh, can you all see my screen share? Yes. Okay, yes. great. All right. So, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, it's great to be here to talk about uh, the technologies that we've been developing to help people look at and control complex biological systems like the brain. Um, you know, the motivation uh, in our group for going after this as a theme was this idea that, you know, well, why is it so hard to control something as complicated as the brain? Why is it so hard to map something as complicated as the brain? And by the way, what I'm going to tell you is, is something that applies not just to the brain, but to tumors, to, um, uh, to the immune system, to development, to aging, to all sorts of parts of biology. But I would argue that there's two really important features that really challenge us in modern biology. How do we cross different spatial scales? Because if you care about the brain or the immune system or a cancer or aging, you're dealing with enormous systems, right? Significant fractions of the body sometime. And yet the business end of of these, of these systems, what actually gets the job done are often molecules that are nanoscale in dimension and organized with nanoscale precision. So how do we cross those spatial scales from nano to cellular to macro to organism? That's a big challenge. And then the other thing that's very difficult to do is to deal with the time axis. So again, if you care about learning and memory or the progression of Alzheimer's disease or the spread of a cancer, or how the immune system changes over days to months to years. These are long-term changes. And yet the physiological events that make the brain and the rest of the body do what it does, those are very brief. You know, in the brain, we have millisecond timescale changes in electrical potential. And throughout the body, we have all sorts of messengers that communicate and compute over timescales of milliseconds to seconds. So only half jokingly, I sometimes say that our job is to conquer space and time. We need to find ways to look at and control biological systems, such as the brain, but not limited to the brain, across these different spatial scales and across these different temporal scales. So today I'll tell you three stories about technologies that we've been developing, one about space and two about time, that uh, we hope are useful to answering lots of different questions in investigating normal biological functions, as well as probing the causes and remedies for diseases. So uh, the first half of the talk, I'll tell you about a story about space, as I mentioned earlier. It's a way of doing nano imaging across extended three-dimensional expanses that we call expansion microscopy. That'll be about the first half of the talk. And then in the second half of the talk, I'll tell you about time. How can we look at and control high-speed signaling in cells. And there's so many signals to be imaged and controlled. Is it possible to image and control many of them at the same time? So let's jump right in. Space, the final frontier. I've always wanted to say that. Uh, uh, I think it's the first time I've actually used it in a seminar, though. OK, so um, we have enormous systems, right? Brains, the immune system, the aging body. And we want to understand all the molecules inside the cells, inside the tissues, inside the organs. Well, many people have worked out ways of doing nano imaging, right? 
you know, soup resolution microscopy, right? Some of the pioneers won the Nobel Prize in chemistry several years ago. Um, electron microscopy, that's another very powerful technique um, that has had huge impact in biology. But all these techniques, they kind of struggle when it comes to imaging a large 3D object, ideally with molecular information. So in our group, um, starting really around 2007, although 2012 was when we really started working on this in earnest, we asked the following question. What if, rather than zooming in onto an image of a biological specimen, we could take a biological specimen and physically inflate it and make it much larger? So this is very different from how the last 300 years of microscopy have been done, where you're gonna zoom in physically on an object rather than zoom in on the image. And so starting with two then graduate students, Faith Chen and Paul Tilburg, and now about half our group works on this technology, we asked the following question. We thought of a lot of ways of doing this, but one way that we converged upon was, could you take a biological specimen, preserved of course, and chemically weave a dense spiderweb-like mesh of swellable polymer, like the stuff in baby diapers, so that the polymer winds its way inside cells and outside cells, in between biomolecules and around biomolecules. If you did it just right, add water and the swallable material will swell, could you physically expand in a way that's precise down to the nanoscale, a biological specimen? Well, we started reading lots of papers and uh, one interesting line of research was uh, from the late 1970s from people like Toyoshi Tanaka, uh, who was an MIT professor at the time. Unfortunately, he passed away relatively young, so I never got to meet him. But in 1980, he published a fantastic paper where he explored the physics of swellable gels, highly charged polymers that you add water to. The water is drawn in through osmosis, like in this cartoon, and the polymer threads, shown in white, swell apart from each other. And he worked out some of the beautiful physics of this. He made the analogy of these rapid changes in volume to a phase transition and showed that under certain conditions, the mathematics and the physics actually have a lot of connections between phase transitions and the massive swelling of a polymer when you add water. Strangely enough, around the same time, 1981, two people solved the other half of the problem. You can't just dump the polymer on top of the brain, right? You have to somehow weave that dense spider web like mesh of polymer inside of it. In 1981, Christine Dreyer and Peter Hausen published a paper. Uh, which was way ahead of its time, where they took preserved tissues and synthesized swellable hydrogel, excuse me, not swellable hydrogels throughout them. They used an uncharged hydrogel, polyacrylamide, same kind of stuff that you do Western blots with. But they showed that if you chemically synthesize this mesh of hydrogel polymer throughout, you could actually facilitate antibody staining, imaging, and other useful imaging properties. So it's fun to think about if somebody had put two and two together, you know, several decades ago, maybe what I'm telling you about in the rest of the first half of this talk could have been developed, you know, nearly, you know, the better part of half a century ago. Okay, so the core concept is we're going to chemically weave a dense spider web like mesh of polymer. We're going to pull apart all the building blocks of life apart from each other. So a cell like the one on the left hand of the slide will be turned into something like the right hand of the slide. A constellation of biomolecules hovering in space in three dimensions, their relative organization preserved, but they're all farther apart from each other. More precisely, two biomolecules that are touching or interacting will now be some minimum distance apart, and two molecules that are some distance apart will have that distance scaled up by a linear factor. So we thought about this for a while, and we decided that we would have to invent several chemistries to make this work, which I'll illustrate for you in the following little cartoons. The first thing is you need anchors, handles. You need some way to pull the molecules apart from each other. And so we now have invented handles that bind to DNA, that bind to RNA, that bind to proteins, and equip them with little handles or anchors so you can pull them apart. In this little animation, the brownish blobs are proteins, and the proteins are getting little purple handles. And again, as I mentioned, we developed a whole family of these that will bind to molecular targets. Next, 
you need to weave that dense spider web like mesh of polymer. Uh, we actually use a recipe that strangely enough is kind of similar to what Hausen and Dreyer published decades ago. We bring in monomers shown as little white spheres and they self-assemble through a process called polymerization into long polymer chains. And when a polymer chain encounters a handle, they form a bond. So the polymers can create the force to pull the molecules apart and the handles convey the force. Well, it turns out that we still have to figure out a really tricky thing. How do we get the molecules to release their hold on each other so we can pull them apart? After all, many of them are in, embedded in complexes, right? And so we use detergents, we use heat, we use enzymes to loosen up or sometimes even chop up the biomolecules. Then we add water, the polymer threads swell apart from each other. But this time, because of the softening and because of the handles, all the biomolecules that are anchored will come along for the ride. So a little bit more than half a decade ago, we announced that this was possible. Panel B shows a piece of the mouse brain before we expand it. Panel C is the same piece of mouse brain about a day and a half later. It's not much work to do this. And um, it's expanded by 100 times in volume, about four, four and a half fold in each direction. The cartoons on the left show the polymer. Initially, it's very dense. The spacing between polymer threads is only a couple nanometers, smaller than many biomolecules. In the lower right, excuse me, in the lower left is the polymer after it expands. It's increased in size. So by design, the way we anchor the way we form these dense spider web like meshes, the way we soften. By design, we wanted the protocol to be as even in expansion as possible. But this is biology. We had to validate it. And so in the first two or three years, we spent a lot of time validating the fundamental principles of expansion. One way to validate is to take pre-expansion images with a classical nanoscale imaging method like super resolution methods such as STORM or SIM. Then after you expand, you take a picture on a regular old microscope, like a confocal microscope at your local core facility, which is how we did it in the beginning. And then we compare post expansion. Does it look different than how it should? Here, the pre expansion is in purple and the post expansion is in green. These are hex cells in culture stained with fluorescent antibodies against tubulin. We compare pre and post, and we try to nudge them to overlay them as well as possible. And to be upfront, the error is not zero, but it's very small, a few percent over a microscope field of view. And for the vast majority of biological questions that we ask right now, that's okay. And it's very rare that somebody's trying to measure the distance between two points and they need to know it's exactly 388.11 microns or something. The vast majority of biological questions are about the relative organization, the co-localization, the interaction, that kind of thing between molecules. That said, uh, we are working to make the process even more perfect, and I hope we'll be down some point in the next couple of years to um, hopefully low single digit nanometer resolution, but we're not quite there yet. The other way to validate is to compare what we see to the known ground truth. So we know what microtubules look like thanks to decades of fantastic work by people doing electron microscopy, X-ray imaging and the like. We can take our expanded images, deconvolve or divide them by the known ground truth and calculate the error that we're adding. What we found was for a four and a half fold expansion, a 300 nanometer resolution lens, sort of a typical microscope lens, well, 300 divided by four and a half is around 70 nanometers of error, roughly. And that's what we find. We get around 70 nanometers of error um, when we do a four and a half fold expansion. Now, if you recall, earlier I told you the polymer spacing is only two nanometers or so. If we expand more, can we get better resolution? And as I'll show you later, we can. But even with four and a half fold expansion, there are many things you can do that are difficult, if not impossible, to do with older technologies. Here's an example. Here we have a pretty big piece of brain tissue, a couple millimeters in dimension. Um, for the aficionados, we have the cortex up here at the top, and you can see where my, where my mouse is pointing, the hippocampus, 
each image we zoom into into the box below. Right, the white box in each picture is zoomed in into the box below it. The color code is shown on the left hand side. The colors represent different fluorescent antibodies we're using against different targets. Anyway, the left hand side, I hope you'll see, gets blurrier the more we zoom in. This is pre expansion imaging taken on a regular confocal microscope. But the right side, you can see much more precisely high resolution images. And the blue and the red stains are pre and postsynaptic sides of synapses. And we can now resolve those pre and postsynaptic densities. In fact, we get the same distance between the pre and postsynaptic sides that Catherine Duloc and Xiao Wei Zhuang measured many years ago using storm microscopy invented by Xiao Wei. But uh, now we took these images on a regular old confocal microscope. So take home message number one is with expansion microscopy, as we call it, you can do nano imaging on a regular microscope. We just upgraded all the microscopes around. But when you expand, you know, you fill it with water, right? You expand it a hundredfold by adding water, which causes the baby diaper material, sodium polyacrylate for the aficionados, to swell. As a result, the end result is about 99% water. So you can also use so-called light sheet microscopes, where you shine light from one angle and take a picture at an orthogonal angle, and you can go at blazingly fast speeds. So here's a paper we did with Eric Betzig's group. Eric also pioneered a different super resolution method called POM. Um, and he was very skeptical of expansion when we first told him. But over time, he became a fan of it. And we ended up writing a paper together. It was on the cover of Science in January 2019, spearheaded by Ray Gao, Shou Asano, and Gokul Apadiyula, working across our two groups. Anyway, there's cool biology that we did. You could label with antibodies against mitochondrial or lysosomal proteins shown in the upper right. We can label against myelin proteins shown at the bottom. Um, of course, there's a lot of biological interest in many protein targets that are a fundamental nanoscale organization. But another novel thing about this paper was they we use one of these light sheet microscopes, the lattice light sheet that Eric built. And if you expand and then do this light sheet imaging, we can go at blazing fast speeds, almost a thousand times faster than the nearest equal resolution, super resolution method. And it's just a matter of engineering to go even faster. So with speed, you can get scale. Here we are looking at dendritic spines, really important for neural connections across the entire thickness of the mouse cortex. Layer one on the right, layer six on the left. Each dotted box, we zoom into the panel below, and you can see that we can get extremely fine scale imaging of small nanoscale neuronal compartments. So you can do nano imaging on a regular microscope, or you can upgrade a high-speed microscope to have incredible precision and speed. Another popular thing to do is to look at neural wiring in the brain. Um, here at the bottom are neurons expressing combinations of fluorescent proteins, or brainbow, uh, as uh, Jeff Lichtman's group, one of the key pioneers, uh, announced, uh, named it in their, their first paper announcing the idea many years ago. Brainbow is very cool. You barcode neurons, basically, by giving, giving them color codes. But if you zoom in, of course, you quickly hit the resolution limit of your microscope. The white box at the bottom is zoomed in at the top middle. Expand, though, as you see in the top right, and now you can see the fine wiring of the brain. So many, many groups now are doing some kind of barcoding or color coding, followed by expansion, and then mapping the brain. Everything I showed you so far is with protein visualization, but uh, us, Waski and Fade Chen worked in our group to get it working for RNA. Because, you know, we want to visualize all the biomolecules of the, in biology, right? So here we uh, anchored and expanded both proteins and RNA, and then we could look at the location and identity of individual RNAs, even in complex parts of cells. After all, neurons have one nucleus, but thousands of connections. The regulation of gene expression is, is clearly being done at a spatial level, can we map it out? Recently, we showed that we could expand a brain and then do in situ sequencing of the RNA. This is a way of doing multiplex RNA analysis. You know, after all, the genome has thousands of genes. What if you look at the location and identity of lots of RNAs at once? So Shahar Alon, Dan Goodwin, Anu Sinha, Oswasi, and Fei Chen are the five co-first authors of this paper, which we just published a couple of days ago. 
We take a brain and expand it, and then we basically run sequencing chemistry right there inside the brain. When you sequence, you're copying a nucleic acid, right? As you copy it, it blinks out its identity. And so in the right-hand side of the slide is a piece of the mouse brain in the upper right. In the lower right are 17 cycles of sequencing, and you can see that a given dot, which corresponds to an individual expressed gene or RNA, will blink out its identity over 17 cycles of sequencing. That's about enough to guess what gene we're looking at quite often. So now we can look at the identity and location of many genes in different parts of a, of a brain cell. You know, this is sort of a crowded slide, but all these dots in the middle of the slide are located at different points in a cell. And we highlighted a few of them, and the acronyms nearby are the gene names. We can locate and identify individual expressed RNAs throughout complex neural architecture. Now, there are different ways of doing the sequencing. You know, we did not invent uh, the basic ideas of sequencing, of course. What we're doing is borrowing them and then putting them into the expansion context. But another way of doing sequencing um, is to bring in uh, a little probe that hybridizes to your target RNA, and then you sequence a little barcode on the probe. And so we thought we'd try that out as well, and we uh, uh, developed a sort of optimized version of it. Um, and the idea then is, can we use this to get very high yield interrogation of cell types and RNA locations in the brain? So we showed that we could get it to work, so-called barcode sequencing in the brain. And for fun here, we're looking at uh, the mouse uh, cortex in panel E, layer one on the right, layer six on the left. And we took a data set from the Allen Institute for Brain Science, where they did lots of RNA sequencing. We made these little barcoded probes against many of the genes that they identified, several dozen. We then sequenced the barcodes, again, right there inside the expanded brain, and showed that we could actually identify lots of cell types throughout the entire thickness of the mouse cortex. And of course, we can look at nanoscale compartments of cells, like I told you earlier. We could locate and identify individual RNAs, even in very small parts of cells, like individual synaptic connections. That's interesting because maybe we can start to derive the rules of gene expression across a neuron. And that's something we're very excited about. As a side note, this doesn't involve expansion, not yet, but we just had a paper also collaborating with Jason Buonrostro and Fei Chen, their two groups, spirited by Andrew Payne, Zach Chang, and Paul Rignato, where we showed that we could do something similar in situ sequencing of the genome. We could sequence the genome um, right there inside of a cell, and that would help us not just have the sequence of the genes, but also we would know the 3D configuration of the genome. And so we're really trying to, as you can see, understand how all the biomolecules of life are organized in 3D throughout complex systems. OK, back to the main story of expansion microscopy. So everything I've showed you so far is expanded by about you know four, four and a half fold, roughly. But can we expand more? Can we get down to the fundamental resolution, you know, the size of individual molecules, or even better? Well, when J.B. Chang was in the group, we worked on a way to iteratively expand. Take a specimen, polymerize and expand it, like I told you before, form a second polymer in the space opened up by the first expansion, and expand it again. So you get exponential spatial amplification with a linear number of steps. Dablina Sarkar, Jinyan Kang, and Oswasi along with great help from Margaret Schroeder, and also, I should mention, Amuchi Emanari and Christina Kitko uh, both developed important variants of this. Um, what, what they've been doing is building a version of this that uses all off-the-shelf chemicals. So I won't go into the original chemistry that JB worked out, because um, we have a, a simpler way of doing it now. Um, the basic idea, as shown in the bottom part of this cartoon, is kind of what I mentioned. We polymerize and expand it fourfold before a second polymer and expand it a second time stretching the original polymer a little bit further. But this figure, this cartoon, illustrates another reason why to do that. The top row of this cartoon shows what happens when you try to label biomolecules. The labels have to get inside in between the biomolecules, right? Sometimes that means you only label proteins on the outside of a complex. So for example, the red and green antibodies can bind proteins on the outside of a synaptic complex, shown in the upper right of this cartoon. But if you decrowd, if you separate proteins from each other, now antibodies can access proteins inside the complex. And so in the lower right of this cartoon, the blue and yellow antibodies can make their way inside. 
and label proteins, in this case, proteins that were previously invisible. So we can look at synapses. Here we are looking at synaptic proteins after decrowding them from each other. The color codes are shown above each image. Um, and with 20 fold expansion, four times four is about 20, um, we are getting really great resolution. As in the lower, lower right, we're getting resolution, we think, around 20 nanometers. So really starting to, to um, get down to the resolution where maybe soon, not quite there yet, but soon we can look at individual molecules. Does the decrowding work? Well, in panels B, C, and D, we can see that the, the crowding does work. In yellow is pre-expansion staining, and there's not much yellow to look at. In magenta is the post-expansion staining. Same antibodies, same specimens, same fields of view. But in these cases, a calcium channel in panel B, a pre protein in panel C, a post protein in panel D, after we expand the proteins away from each other, we can get much more detailed labeling than pre-expansion. And we don't think it's background staining because we don't see the staining appearing at random places. It's increasing at these synaptic connections. Um, here are some synaptic proteins in panels F, G, and H that don't get brighter after expansion. The yellow and the magenta look very similar. So not all proteins are in crowded environments, only some of them are. Working with Tom Blanpete's group, we decided to see if this decrowding could let us see nanostructures that were previously invisible. Tom has been working on so-called nanocolumns for quite a while. That's how pre- and post-synaptic proteins are organized um, into patterns. They're not just randomly distributed. The two, the two sides of a synapse are correlated with each other. And to take a long story short, those calcium channels that we can now see that were previously invisible, we see that they are organized into clusters that correlate with other clusters pre- and post-synaptic um, at neural connections. So there's something going on here where maybe to facilitate how neurons communicate, we have different uh, proteins being organized with nanoscale precision across the synaptic cleft with respect to each other. Working with Li Wei Tsai, um, we decided to investigate Alzheimer's disease. So of course in Alzheimer's, there, there are all sorts of densely packed proteins. Here we looked at a Alzheimer's model mouse we stained pre-expansion shown in yellow and post-expansion shown in magenta against amyloid plaques. After we expanded the plaques, we got much denser labeling. And in fact, we saw all sorts of structures that were not visible before. In fact, if you look at the bottom part of the slide, we even saw these little amyloid dots, little almost periodic structures made out of amyloid. This happened with multiple independent antibodies and we did not see it in wild type mice. So we don't think again, that is nonspecific staining. We, we went on to show that these little amyloid dots, if you will, contained other kinds of proteins, including ion channels. And this is sort of a lot of analysis of the geometry of this, but it goes to show that we can really look at the nanoscale organization of how different proteins aggregate, but maybe how they interact in these aggregates. Now, everything I've shown you so far is about the brain, but we've also shown this to work in a wide variety of tissues, including human biopsies from patients. When Yangshen Zhao and Octavia Bucur worked with my group and Andy Beck's group, we showed that we could look at um, human prostate, lung, breast, pancreas, all sorts of different tissue types. Normal here is on the left, cancer containing on the right, the color code is in the upper right. Um, but suffice it to say that we could look at a lot of different tissues uh, even from human patients, and look at interesting patterns that were only visible after we had nanoscale and molecular visualization capability. So let me summarize this first part of the talk. We've discovered that we can physically expand biological specimens. That makes many microscopes, ordinary microscopes, into nanoimaging devices. We can apply this to visualize lots of different things, including proteins, nucleic acids, and we have uh, ongoing work to visualize other molecule types as well. You can apply it to a wide variety of different species, including human specimens, and a wide variety of different tissue types. And um, I'll just note this slide here. You know, we have a website, expansionmicroscopy.org. Many people have visited it, and even we have step-by-step -step photographic tutorials. So even in the COVID era, people can teach themselves how to do expansion. 
It's already been used in over 200 experimental papers and preprints. These aren't reviews, these are actual experimental papers. Um, it's being applied to look at motor proteins. It's being applied to look at fruit fly brains, human kidney biopsies, the microbiome, plant tissues. The list goes on and on and on. Biology, after all, is fundamentally about nanoscale things, but it's, it's been hard to do, to, to do nanoscale imaging, and now we've democratized it. So please visit our website, expansionrancoscopy.org. Again, we have step-by-step, -step, even classroom-style tutorials, and I don't know, maybe thousands of, of people are now doing it. 220 papers have already come out, um, but uh, it's spreading very quickly. And uh, if you have any questions, email me, and uh, we'd love to provide technical support. You know, we really are excited about the democratization of nanoimaging. So that's the first half of the talk, and we're about the half hour mark. Um, of course, the big limitation of expansion microscopy is that you cannot do it on a living thing. And so in the last half of my talk, I want to talk about time. How can we look at and control living processes? Well, I'll just briefly mention optogenetics because it's a pretty mature field. In optogenetics, we use light to control neural activity. And uh, this started when Carl Dysroth, my co-inventor and I were both students at Stanford. And we just started brainstorming through all the laws of physics. What kinds of energy could we deliver to the brain? Magnetic fields, mechanical force. And we thought light would be really cool because it's fast, of course, and you can aim it. And there's inexpensive ways to get light into a target. You could just use an optical fiber. The next question was, how do you make brain cells sense light? Now, you could invent a light sensor, or you could find a light sensor. And uh, I got really fascinated by a class of molecules known as microbial opsins. These are membrane proteins, like shown in the lower left, that bind a chemical, all transretinal. And in microbes, they pump or transport ions from one side of a membrane to the other. For example, they're found in salty water, as shown in the upper left. So half a century ago, people found light-driven proton pumps from microbes. A little bit later, people found light-driven chloride pumps from the same kinds of microbes. And then around the turn of the century, people found light-driven ion channels. So these were very exciting to me because what if you could use them in neurons? If they were safe enough, fast enough, and powerful enough, you could express the gene into a neuron if you were very lucky, maybe the brain would make the all transretinal, so you wouldn't have to add any chemicals. And maybe if you were lucky, it would be fast enough and safe enough to use. And amazingly, that was the case. So uh, when all three of these classes have been very useful in neuroscience. When Brian Chow and Xu Han worked with me, we expressed light-driven proton pumps in neurons and found that some of them were powerful enough and fast enough and safe enough that you could shine light on neurons expressing the gene, and they would pump positive charge protons out of the neuron when you shine, for example, green light on them, and you could turn neurons off. So by turning a neuron off, you could figure out what it's needed for. Sure, and later Amy Chuang uh, found that we could use light-driven chloride pumps in neurons, as shown in the middle of the slide, to also turn neurons off. Initially collaborated with Carl Dysroth, I found that we could express light-driven ion channels in neurons. And later in my group, Nathan Klepecki or Shamesh, uh, Jan Kutro and others have worked on perfecting light activation of neurons. So this is a very mature area. You know, uh, these molecules are very widespread in use by literally thousands of people to study the brain. By turning neurons off, you can figure out what they're needed for. By turning them on, you can figure out what they're sufficient for. And to make a long story short, we were just extremely lucky. These molecules just out of the box were safe enough, fast enough, and powerful enough to mediate neural control. Amazingly, mammalian neurons even seem to, I don't know, we still don't know why or how, but they make that all transretinal, the chemical that these molecules need to sense light. I mean, how lucky can one, one field get, right? Um, so 
Recently, our group started thinking, what about the flip side? We want to image biological signaling. And here, we have not been so lucky. The world has not evolved out there in nature. Molecules that just on their own report biological signals. And there's so many biological signals, right? You know, what, 30,000 genes in the human genome? Wouldn't it be great to image all of those functions in real time in a living cell and see how they interact? Is that even possible? Well, we started breaking down the problem into parts. We thought there's at least two parts. One is, how can you rapidly make new indicators, fluorescent indicators that would glow, keeping with the theme of light, that would glow when a cell has a particular signal on? And then how could you use many signals together in the same living cell so you can understand them as a network? How do all those signals work together? Well, to make indicators faster, Erica Jung and Kiro Pjakovic rank group, we worked on ideas to automate directed evolution. So in directed evolution, you take a gene and make a lot of mutants. Some are better and some are worse for any given goal. That's what you see in the top half of the slide. Then we express the mutants in cells and use an automated robotic microscope to pick out the cells and therefore the mutants that are better for our goal. We use our little, a little robotic arm to suck out those cells and therefore the mutants that are better. Here's a picture of that robotic arm uh, installed on an actual microscope. It's a commercially available thing, so anybody can do robotic directed evolution of this kind. We use this to do what might have been at the time the largest mammalian cell-based directed evolution screen. Um, we screened for a fluorescent voltage indicator. So we wanted a molecule that would get brighter in fluorescence when a neuron was depolarized in voltage. We did two rounds of evolution and we screened for brightness, localization to the membrane, because that's where the voltage is, and photostability. We began with a molecule from Adam Cohen's group at Harvard, a candidate fluorescent voltage indicator they call Quasar 2. And to make a long story short, we were able to improve the membrane localization as shown in the upper left, and we also improved the brightness. We improved the signal to noise as shown in the upper right, and we preserved the speed shown in the lower left, and we improved the photostability shown in the lower right. So excited by this, we decided, can we use it in the living brain? Um, now, if you express these molecules all over the membranes of neurons, you get a lot of fluorescence from everywhere. So we fuse it to a little peptide to locally locate, it, locate the molecule at the cell body. So you get these nice little circles rather than just everything lighting up. Working with Shohan's group, we uh, you, uh, use a simple microscope shown in the upper left to image the fluorescence of neurons using this indicator, a soma localized voltage indicator in awake behaving mice. And amazingly, we could pick up the voltage of neurons. So in the upper left, we shine a red laser onto the brain. We collect the fluorescent light that is redshifted, of course, onto a CMOS camera. And in the middle of the slide, you'll see what look like electrical traces, but they're being acquired on that microscope shown in the upper left from different parts of the mouse brain. And these are awake but head-fixed mice. In fact, we can have the mouse doing you know, some kind of behavior, and we can look at the activity of lots of neurons. Um, so this is just one example. We're looking at the hippocampus of an awake behaving mouse, head fixed under that microscope, and there's about a dozen neurons in this field of view, and we could image about, um, and we saw that about eight of them had some kind of activity. So that's one idea. Can we um, evolve indicators of powerful functions? By the way, this whole idea of locating an indicator at one part of a cell and not other parts to clean up the image, it's a pretty powerful idea. Um, so uh, Orshamesh, Chegang Lingu, and Kirill Pjakovic, uh, we took the idea of that we used to locate the voltage indicator just at the cell body, and we did it for a calcium indicator as well. Panel A, the calcium indicator is everywhere, so you get a lot of background light from all over the place. Panel B is just at the cell body, and we clean up the background a lot. Panel C and D is for a different calcium indicator. Anyway, what we find 
shown at the bottom part of the slide is that when the calcium indicator is everywhere, you get a lot of crosstalk because cells are touching, of course, and, and so you get stray light from one cell that contaminates the signal from another cell, leading to artifactual correlations. But if you put the indicator just at the cell body, you reduce that background and clean up the correlations. So thinking like a signal processing expert or thinking like an engineer can be very helpful in addition to the directed evolution angle. Now for the final story I want to tell you, there are lots of fluorescent indicators. People have made fluorescent indicators, genetically encoded indicators for all sorts of signals. Not just calcium, like I showed you earlier, not just voltage, but kinases, cell cycle proteins, growth factors, ions, metabolites, sugars. The list goes on and on and on. We now have hundreds of these. Of course, there are thousands of genes in the genome, so many more remain to be invented. But in recent years, we started wondering, you know what? We want to understand how all these signals work together, right? How does a cell compute? And how does it go wrong in a disease? All these molecules interact in complex networks. You need to see many interacting molecules at once in the same cell to understand the relationship between those signals. Now, the usual way you address this is you make a couple indicators of different colors, one based on a green protein, one based on a red protein. Now you can see both in the same cell. But that, that's a lot of work, right? You got to make a whole new indicator. It'd be great if we could use all these existing indicators. And then what if you want more than two colors? Well, in recent years, people have started to try to make three indicators at once, but that's still a lot of work. Um, and uh, it's a lot, of, and, and so how, it wouldn't be great if you could just use a bunch of indicators at the same time. Well, Shannon Johnson and Cheng Yang Lin Gu in our group, we explored the following idea. What if you could take a bunch of indicators of different signals and just put them at different points in a cell? So this cartoon, reporters of one signal are at the points labeled one. Reporters of a second signal are at the points labeled two. Well, while the cell is alive, those points will blink at you, indicating the, the live cell signals that those reporters indicate, and they'll, re, they'll yield little movies or traces. Once you're done, you can preserve the cell and stain those puncta or dots with stains one after the other and figure out which indicator is where. Because when a cell is preserved, as I alluded to in the first half of the talk, you could do all sorts of tricks with barcodes and all sorts of stuff and, and uh, measure lots of biomolecules at once, once a cell is preserved, right? Okay, well, can you make it work? Well, here's an idea of how we actually were able to make it work. We can take fluorescent reporters off the shelf ones that other people already made. We fuse them to self-assembling peptides so that reporters will cluster safely and effectively. And then for the staining, we can equip each reporter with an epitope that later we can stain with an antibody. And as I kind of alluded to in the first part of the talk, you know, you can do all sorts of cool tricks with antibody staining. Um, you know, one thing you could do, of course, is you could stain, take a picture, and then you could wash out the antibody, stain again, take another picture, and you can do that over and over again. Here's a little cartoon that the LMRU studio made for us. When the cell is alive, you see lots of green dots. Once you're done, you preserve the cell, stain it, potentially over many rounds of staining and washing, and then image it and figure out which, which reporter was at each point. Well, does it work? Well, in panel B is a calcium indicator. In panel C, the same calcium indicator has been fused to a pair of self-assembling peptides. We chose a pair so we could make clusters that are a little bit bigger than if you use just one. Amazingly, this works. The reporters have the same signal intensity, the same dynamic range, the same kinetics. The cell has the same physiology, um, the same uh, calcium responses, for example, as a normal cell. And there doesn't seem to be, this is not in this figure, but it's in our paper, there doesn't seem to be any 
solve health problems, no DNA damage, no microglial inflammation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can make, through bioengineering, safe, effective nanostructures in living cells. And here we're using them to cluster reporters. Amazingly, this was modular. We could take three different reporters, here for calcium, cyclic AMP, and protein kinase A, fuse them to three different sets of self-assembling peptides, and fuse them additionally to three different epitopes. We can later do antibody staining, potentially over many rounds, to figure out what reporter was where, and it works. The upper right shows a single cultured neuron expressing three different clusters. Panels B and C are zoom-ins. In each of the B and C, green is the live cell image, lots of green dots, and the false color images show the identity shown by antibody staining of each green dot. So some of the green dots were actually calcium indicators, some were cyclic AMP indicators, some were protein chi kinase A indicators, and what this lets you do is to measure all these in concert at the same time in the same living cell. So I got interested in these three indicators because, of course, they're very important for many processes, not just in neuroscience, but throughout biology. And so we asked ourselves, what if we stimulate the cell by giving a drug, forsglin? Can we understand the output, the protein kinase A? Well, we saw two subclusters of neurons. Some had delayed calcium responses, shown in H, and some had fast calcium responses, shown in I. Later, we looked at the protein kinase A responses, and amazingly, there was a relationship. We used forsquid to drive the cyclic AMP, and the, and the question was, is the calcium potentially modulating the protein kinase A? Well, on the lower right, you can see that the neurons with the fast calcium responses, shown in red, had stronger PKA, PKA, protein kinase A, outputs. The neurons with the slower calcium responses in blue had weaker protein kinase A outputs. So we can derive relationships between these different signals in a living cell. Of course, if you looked at these three signals in three different cells, you would not know those relationships. You can express these punctuated clustered gene uh, products in the living brain. Here we are doing it in the mouse hippocampus. And we saw the same kind of relationship. Panel D, some neurons had fast calcium and some had slow. And in panel E, the neurons of the fast calcium had strong PKA responses, shown in red. The neurons with the weaker or delayed calcium responses had weaker PKA responses, shown in blue. So we can derive consistent relationships of different signals across different preparations of the brain. Can we do more than three signals? Well, yeah. So in panel J, you can see we have four different reporters. We threw in a protein kinase C reporter. K and L are zoom-ins again of panel J. Green showing live cells and false color showing the post hoc antibody staining. And at the bottom, you can see we can indeed see four different signals at once in a single living cell. We can do five. Here's a, we threw in an ERK kinase signal and you can also combine multicolor signals with this clustering strategy. So here, the ERK signal is uh, using a red fluorescent reporter, but now, as you can see at the bottom, we can observe five different signals in the same living cell. So to summarize the third part of the talk, I'm very excited about this idea of evolving, but also through signal processing concepts like spatial multiplexing, of pointing to a future where we could look at many signals at once in a living cell, and we can derive the relationships between them. So we disseminate all these tools as freely as possible. Visit our website, synthneuro.org, and we have pointers to all of them. But I thought I'd just end on a science note, because we have a few minutes left. I'm very interested in combining all these tools. I would love to image lots of signals in a, in a living brain perturb them and figure out the causality, and then use expansion to make a map of the brain. Could we understand someday an entire small brain? When Lamore Freifeld was in our group, she adapted the expansion process to the larval zebrafish brain, and it works.
JU adapted it to the C. elegans worm. Both of these very well-studied model organisms have small brains, but they can do interesting behaviors. And of course, the indicators for live cell imaging that I mentioned earlier also work in these small animals. So for example, we can do live cell voltage imaging in the larval zebrafish. The magenta trace in the middle right of the slide shows voltage imaging of a neuron in the larval zebrafish brain. And here we have the worm C. elegans, where we're imaging voltage in the worm. So I would love to use these tools in an integrative way in the coming years. So I'll end there. I've acknowledged along the way all the people who led the projects in our group, but there's a very long list of people who helped at the top of the slide, and an even longer list of people in, the, in our collaborative network in the middle of the slide who have helped with these projects. There's not time to mention all of these names, but I think I'll end on this slide. And again, we really want to help. Visit our website, synthonero.org, shown in the upper right, to learn how to use these tools. We hope we can help a lot of people solve problems. And then don't hesitate to email me if we can provide any kind of support. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic. So on behalf of everybody in the chat, because I realize not everyone can unmute, I'm going to applaud as loudly as I possibly can. Thank you. Um, the floor is now open for questions. So uh, as always, if, uh, if anyone's done one of these before, um, you can raise your hand uh, and then we'll invite you to kind of come forward and unmute. Uh, or you can type questions in the chat and uh, feel free to, to, do, to do that and I'll read them out as well. Um, so let me just check that there isn't anyone with their hand up at the moment because often it takes a little while for people to type things and stuff like that. So I'll start out with a, a kind of general question, if you don't mind. Um, sure. You've mentioned the role of luck in your, in your work. You got very lucky with optogenetics, but I refuse to believe that your many other successes were not due to luck. How, uh, how did you decide, you know, this is the field I'm going to revolutionize today? Because you, you seem to be, quote unquote, unusually lucky in succeeding in, in where a lot of other people have failed. That's a good question. I think we have three strategies in the group that I really encourage people to practice. One is um, I'm a big fan of what I call constructive failures, messing around with things, but then we accidentally notice something that might not be obvious, and then that pivots us in a new, a new direction. I think this is actually pretty common out there, right? I mean, Google wasn't the first search engine. You know, CRISPR wasn't the first gene editing technique. A lot of, a lot of the big hits in all parts of science and engineering come by looking at what people are doing and saying, you know what, what's, what's missing? And I'll just give an example with expansion microscopy. We tried doing lots of super resolution and it was hard. And uh, I just wanted to do some brain science and I, I couldn't figure out how to do a lot of this stuff. And, and so the people in our group just started messing around, you know, and, and, uh, and that led to uh, this expansion direction, frankly. Um, let's see. So the second thing is we try to have every possible idea. We start making lists of different ideas and then we try to evaluate them very systematically. So, you know, in optogenetics, I mentioned how Carl Dysroth and I just started listing different kinds of energy, magnetic fields, mechanical force, light. There's only so many things you can deliver into the brain, right? It's a very short list. And then uh, we just started doing calculations of how deep could they go? How fast could they be? Turns out you can actually do those calculations pretty fast. I think we did all of them in probably a few afternoons. And um, so being systematic is very powerful. And then thirdly um, is, uh, you know, collaborating, right? We collaborate with a lot of people. And uh, very often we have an idea, but then we hit the limit of our ignorance and don't know what to do next. So for example, for the institute sequencing, we collaborate with a bunch of people, George Church, and I mentioned several other people, you know, we're, at the beginning, we were very new to this whole concept of sequencing. And now, you know, seven years later, ever since we started that project, now we've gotten pretty good at it and are pioneering new, new ideas in that area. So, so yeah, those are the those are three of the sort of strategies that what you might call luck optimization strategies that I like to think about. And we actually try to really actively practice that. And I'll sit down with if, if somebody in the group is stuck and say, all right, let's do a design review. Let's go over every darn slide of data you've ever showed me and look for the patterns. You know, can we turn the constructive failure in a new direction? And very often we notice something that that's funny. Those seven different experiments, there's a common weird thing that's happening. Maybe that's the direction we should go in. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have a question in the chat uh, for all. Oh, hang on. Um, lots of people. Uh, Isabel White says, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. 
do you have a way of tagging neurons that have been imaged with your clusters so that the technique can be applied to it to an in vivo behavioral work and identified post uh, experiment yeah great question so we can um co-express with the cluster a marker protein like an infrared crescent protein and then later we can go back in and find that very cell and then the organization of the clusters i should have mentioned this but the clusters are very stationary so we've you know we've, we've looked out um this might not sound like a long time but we've imaged for up to one hour which is enough to look at something like how calcium couples to pka or something and uh the, the clusters don't move so we can then go back afterwards and into the very same chunk of brain tissue and and post hoc label them yeah that's fairly straightforward cool um and we have a question from julia joanna robel i'm sorry i might be mispronouncing that um would you agree with the statement that the idea of your web page and all of this is to include as many people as possible in the discovery and science education and that's why the tools are available for everyone oh there's so many reasons why yeah so of course equity and inclusion are super important values for our group and and we want to yeah democratize many aspects of science as a result of that um, you know, I really believe in making tools that are not just powerful, but really cheap and easy to use, too. You know, uh, we really want things to be inexpensive and simple. Um, and also, you know, science is driven by luck, in my opinion. And so monopolizing a tool makes no sense. You know, somebody can use our tool and, you know, somebody I've never met might use it to make the transformative discovery in the field. And, and so we want to empower everybody to use these tools. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's many reasons for this. Uh, and and uh, yeah, for science education, for equity and inclusion, but also just because this is the way science works, right? The big discoveries, you know, uh, are made by everybody, right? And it, it's hard to think of any scientific discovery which was made by only one person working all by themselves in, I don't know, the last half century probably. Fantastic. So um, moving on, Lu Kiao Tan uh, uh, says, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, in your opinion, what limits the use of interfering electric fields to control neurons? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so uh, uh, Nir Grossman, who is a postdoc in our group and now you know is, is leading the way in these kinds of things at Imperial, um, had this fantastic paper with us on using interfering electric fields to control neurons. And uh, as I was trying to squeeze everything into this talk, I decided to to focus on some of the more recent work, like the in-situ sequencing or the, the multiplex spatial imaging and, and older topics I, I tried to, to, to unfortunately had to compress. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's a lot of interesting things that, that Mir's group is leading the way on and that we're trying to help with as well. You know, one question is what is the mechanism of the interfering electric field? How does it work? You know, uh, another is can you engineer new strategies to, I don't know, have an array of electrodes. You can focus on very specific parts of the brain and electrically stimulate them. Um, and so that's a very active area that that nears leading the way on and that and that we're also trying to both characterize mechanistically and to develop new new approaches with. And we have joint group meetings every month or so. And yeah, it's a very interesting area. But uh, but yeah, we haven't published that in four years. So I, 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 I try to focus more on the more recent things. Great. Um, so, uh, I, and I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce this horrendously bad, badly. Haja Karui um says uh, that was brilliant thank you uh do you see uh, your work going in the in in the context of nano stimulation looking at memory encoding decoding and as you said figuring out where where and when the whole process fails for people with dementia for example absolutely yeah so again this is a little bit an older paper so i kind of glossed over it um but um the paper uh, in 2017 we did a paper with valentina miliani's group where they developed um she's one of the pioneers of holographic two photon optogenetics and we teamed up with her and built a soma localized opsin and in combination with her two photon holographic optogenetic stimulation showed that we could actively in activate individual cells in intact mammalian brain tissue so there's many people now who are working on um, uh, such ways of patterning individual cells but, um, and and so forth uh, we're trying to set that up now at, at mit as well although it's been a little bit slow going just because uh, again um, we do some hardware work but as you probably can tell from the talk most of the people in the group have more of a molecular focus, but I do collaborate with lots of people on the hardware side and and do joint work. And so that's where I hope where we might go to very precise, spatially precise stimulation. Great. Um, and uh, next question is from Leonid uh, Plina, Plina, uh, who says, thank you for this breathtaking presentation. Uh, I suppose your techniques aren't only neuron specific. I am now considering to apply some of your techniques in studying metabolic disease uh, concerning beta cells, for example. 
Yeah, so the expansion microscopy is applying is being applied all over biology. I mean, a Stanford group adapted it to expand microbiome bacteria. Um, there's at least one paper from people I don't know with expanded expanded plant seeds. Uh, people are applying it to species I've never heard of. Um, yeah, I should probably write another review paper. Uh, <laughs> it's been a couple a couple. You know, it's been only uh, we wrote one in, in Nature Methods uh, that came out in early 2019. But but again, over over 200 papers have and preprints have come out doing some kind of expansion. And then the last part of the talk, I also think applies to um, non-neuronal cells. You know, this whole idea of imaging many signals at once. I mean, that's important, not just for the brain, but I mean, uh, yeah, beta cells. In fact, I did a little podcast with um, uh, a diabetes nonprofit um, and uh, they hosted a brainstorm with many people, um, uh, again, who I, most of who I don't know, this is not my field, who are interested in applying this to diabetes. So. If, if we can help, email me, read the paper. Um, but uh, but yeah, if, any, if I can help clarify anything, you know, all the genes are being freely distributed by nonprofits who distribute these genes. But if we can help or answer questions or you know, give any advice, email me for sure. Great, thank you very much. Um, we had a question pop up from Naomi Nakayama, who says, um, sorry, it's just moved. Uh, amazing talk, thank you. For expansion microscopy, how many different polymers do you try? It seems like the polymer needs to be able to do lots of different things well in terms of going into every, into the space between molecules, bind to them, expand equally no matter the chemical environment, so on and so forth. So how, how did that design process happen? Yeah, well, in the early days of the group, we actually brainstormed about this a bit and we were considering um, uncharged hydrogels, but that would only expand the brain by a little bit. So we kind of didn't do an experiment back in 2007. This is brainstorming with a, a then postdoc, Brian Chow. Um, then in 2012, well, we started really reading a lot of papers, um, Paul and Faye and me, and, and um, then we saw these highly charged polymers that could swell enormously. And, um, and then it took some iteration, especially the softening part. We had a lot of cracking in the early days. Um, but uh, when do we really start earnestly thinking about things? It's probably like summer of 2012. And by uh, by spring of 2013, it was working reasonably well. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, that was that was the process. Great. Um, and Ayush Darap, sorry, I probably butchered that again. Uh, says amazing work. Uh, do you see optogenetics as being scalable in the future to explain most forms of complex behavior, or do you see it specializing in a certain area of neuroscience? Well, lots of people have not activated cells in the brain and shown that you can trigger all sorts of interesting behaviors, anxiety, movement, sensation. The reason why we start, st started working on these other areas, like imaging the brain and mapping the brain, is optogenetics is great for checking a theory of the brain, like perturb this site and see what it does. But if you don't have a theory of the brain, I mean, there's thousands of cell types in the brain, so many regions of the brain. Where do you look? And so if you really want to understand the brain, I think we need to map the brain, control the brain, and record from the brain. Um, so that's kind of why we've been formulating our, our ever since, you know, 2012-ish, our group around these three clusters, right? I think we have to see the brain in action. Once you see that, maybe now you know where to optogenetic return. But again, even a mouse brain has 100 million neurons. If you tried all the combinations, it, it's going to take the age of the universe to explore all the combinations, right? Far more than that, actually. Um, and so you have to have some kind of idea before you do optogenetics, right? And then if you really want to have a detailed model of the brain, you really need to know how it's wired, right? I mean, I can watch my iPhone all day long, um, and, but if I don't know digital logic and how the computer chip works, I might never actually understand how it computes, right? So I think you also need a map. Awesome. Um, I think we have reached the end of our list of questions. So uh, I'm just going to double check that nobody has their hand up, obviously, because that would be rude if I missed them. Um, no, I think we've uh, gone through everyone that uh, that wants to ask. Thank you very much for your time. It's been uh, a, a true pleasure. Wonderful. Um, and I will close the session with another round of applause and a vote of thanks from everybody in Imperial College and uh, external. Great. Cheers. Uh, meeting closed.